Uh, I want to welcome you guys tonight to this virtual program that we're doing. Uh, we weren't sure at the time when we planned this to be a virtual program if we were going to be able to have our uh, Black History Month exhibit up that we usually have at various spots in the building. Um, it's something that, uh, Casey, I was trying to remember when it was um, fully expanded. It always used to be kind of a smaller exhibit that went up um, in February. And I think in 2012, we did a big expansion to try and really tell more of the stories that were in our uh, archives and with our collections to to put out more cases and, and things like that. And over the years, it's kind of, it's changed with new information that we get, new people we find out about, new artifacts that we get. Uh, so I wanted to share some of those stories tonight that you can see in the exhibit. The exhibit is kind of a little bit smaller this year because uh, with COVID, some of the panels that we normally use uh, to be able to put stuff out in the lobby and um, other areas we're, we're using to block off parts of the museum um, to help with traffic flow and, and all of that. So we're, we're down a few panels as normal, but we, we tried to get up um, as much as we could. And there was some construction in the, the gallery that we wanted to put it up in off of uh, the noon and gallery off the lobby. So um, now that that was all done and the moving and everything that was happening over there was finished, we were able to get that installed last week. So we're going to keep it up through uh, March at least so people will be able to come see more of the stories because I uh, wasn't able to share everything that we have in the exhibit and there's lots more that's in the archives too that we haven't um, fully shared because sometimes you know something's better shared with an image or it needs to do uh, more research. So this is where uh, we kind of show gaps that we have in our collection which any uh, museum or organization or archive has these kinds of things, the stories that are not represented uh, that are part of their community. So we always encourage people to share more stories with us. There's a lot of people that are doing that online. There's some individuals that are uh, in the community, some maybe that have left the community. One in particular I can think of is uh, Tim Ayers. He's always, uh, he's a former mayor of Springfield who I believe is in Florida now. And he, uh, all through uh, the month of February, he shares lots of really great stories. And I follow him on Facebook to uh, learn more and find out about people that we don't have represented in our archives to see if you know we can find we can get some of those materials or or, or be able to tell those stories. So I wanted to start with saying um, why is there a Black History Month? Um, I know that I uh, was a little disappointed the other day when we shared information about the exhibit online and we got the you know why isn't there a White History Month and I did not respond but well pretty much most of the history you learn is more white male history. Um, but the other, so there, there's a Women's History Month coming up in March. Black History Month um, is in February. And that came out of, um, in 1926, there was a Harvard uh, trained historian who had started a National Negro History Week. And that uh, eventually evolved into Black History Month to tell those stories that have been left out of the history or um, that have been neglected. And, and you see that across all, um, all cultures and ethnicities, you know, women's history is left out of a lot. Um, there's Asian American History Month. There's there's all sorts there's that to try and cover, make up for some of those lost stories and encourage people to keep those histories and share those histories and to know that it's all part of our local, all, all our community history, our American history, our local history, that it's all important to know all of those stories. So um, I know that we focus on this in, um, in February, but you know, we try and share th stories throughout the year and just because it's part of our local history and we encourage people to help us tell those other parts of community history that are lacking, like um, Latin American history, Asian history, all that, that, that are not uh, fully represented in our archives or our collections. So um, we always try to spread the word and this is always a good opportunity to let people know that we really only have what is uh, offered to us. We don't have a very large staff to go out and actively collect um, things that we know are probably out there, but we're not pounding the pavement to get stuff like we wish we, we would be able to possibly if we had more space and um, more time and more staff and everything to, to handle all of that. So um, that's the dream to be able to encompass it all, but just to let people know that we're here to take those stories and, and that um, material is what we, we want people to know. So I'm gonna start with um, going through some of the slides to share um, some of the stories we have. Um, this is being recorded, so this will be out there afterwards for, for people to look at, um, just like all of our other Zoom programs. Um, the first slide we have here is one of our earliest known uh, African-American property owning families, uh, the Basie family. And 
there was actually two different Basie families that were connected, but they came to Springfield around the same time and they were some of the earliest landowners. And this picture here uh, uh, shows a 1913 family reunion. Uh, so I, I don't think I sh the, the shared, uh, there's a really great ID on the back of this where it circles all the people and has names by them and explains who they are, which is an archivist's dream to get information like that with a photo where everybody's identified and explains how they're connected to each other and, and all of that. So this was a, a really wonderful photo to have. Um, but the, the, uh, the head of the family, Perry Basie, um, these are his descendants. Um, he was a slave in Kentucky and they came here in 1858. So they were some of our earliest uh, landowners. And uh, another slide is someone who's connected to the family. We've got Yearly Basie, another um, member of uh, the patriarch of the, of the family. And this was a, um, the police officer here, um, his connection was, he was the father of the, he was, his father was the son of Yearly Basie. Um, so grandfather, I'm uh, getting that correct. So um, this is, he was uh, part of the police department, um, joined it in 1900. And he's someone that we, I've just recently learned more about. Um, we have the history of the police department that was written in 1909. Uh, and uh, this, he was under police chief Robert O'Brien. And, uh, we ran across his picture just going through the newspapers when he passed away in 1920. And we said, oh, um, we went back to the book and realized, yes, he was listed in the book as a member of the police department um, that had joined in 1900. So we did a little more research so we could um, be able to tell his story and his connection to that early family. Um, but sadly, he, he was with the department for about 20 years and um, was promoted, appointed to detective, uh, but died the same year in 1920, um, just not long after being appointed to that position. Another early family story that we have is the uh, the Gammon family and the Gammon house. Um, they built their small brick house, which you see now here in its restored form that is more along the lines of how it looked when they lived there. Um, they built it around 1850 and it's at 620 Pickwell Place. So it runs parallel to um, Fountain? No, Limestone? No, wrong direction. Uh, Someone on mute to tell me which, but it's 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 Pickle Place. You can see it from um, there. There's an open field though, so you can see across it now. And it, and I we were there a few weeks ago, and it's much easier to see now um, when they've got this this sign out front. So the story of the house is that um, the Gammons were uh, George and Sarah Gammon were um, had raised their six children there, and in the meantime, they were part of the Underground Railroad network, which was very rare for. Um, African Americans to be part of that network. They were one of only three known um, in Ohio to be owned by African Americans, and just to be part of the Underground Railroad network was 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 very um, well. It was illegal to be to help um, slaves, and the Fugitive Slave Act made it so that um, you could have a prison term of up to six months or and a fine of a thousand, which would be a, the equivalent of about thirty six thousand dollars today if you um, helped anybody who was fleeing slavery. So the stations that existed, the Underground Railroad stations, really only knew about the next one that they were sending people to. So they, you know, it was safer for them to not know about their whole network. So it does make it very difficult to um, do research on um, places that were part of the Underground Railroad. But we've got a great collection in the archives um, that was a lot of the work of Art Thomas, um, a gentleman in the community. Um, African-American who's uh, played a big role in helping people find um, in the African-American community find their ancestors. And he did a lot of research on um, Underground Railroad homes in, in the area, um, you know, suspected ones and trying to do more research on that. Um, but, this, but going back to the story of the Gammon House itself, uh, there's a lot of people who played a role in it being restored. Um, Casey, I'm not sure the exact timeline. I think I, I seem to remember about 2008 was when they started doing a lot of work. I think you just muted yourself. Um, but they there was a lot of people that uh, have had have played a role in it. One person that I've seen a lot lately is John Bailey. Uh, he's he's part of the um, the Gammon House group, and he's been in a lot to the research library to do research, not just on the Gammon House, but on other houses in that neighborhood. Um, he helps people with that, but he's part of the um, the uh, 
the Gammon House group, which other people in that are Art Thomas, the way I had mentioned, um, and Dale Henry, Betty Grimes, Gail Grant, and um, Ken Stone, they've all um, started the project. Well, in the late 1990s, they had identified, um, Art Thomas brought to the attention of the city, the house was slated for demolition, that this was the, the history of the house and that it needed to be saved. Um, and they worked with the South Fountain Preservation Association, who eventually took over ownership of that, the property, and then they deeded it to the Gammon House Committee, which is who runs it now. Um, and the house was in, oh, sorry, I have it on automatic. Um, the house was in pretty bad shape at that time. Um, it had had a lot of additions on it, so it no longer looked like the, the way it w would have looked. Um, and it had sat vacant for about 20 years. So there was a lot of work that needed to be done. So they worked with um, uh, the city of Springfield, the Turner Foundation, the Springfield F Foundation helped with funding and they had individual donors. Um, I know we had had an exhibit of one, at one point of archeological finds that they had found excavating around the house. And now those are on display in the house. And I remember being there. That's why I can't remember when it exactly project started. I'm, I'm sure that information is online and they could tell you um, the details. But I remember being there at one point when there was no floor and you had to walk across boards. So they kind of um, did everything in phases. They um, fixed the doors and windows and um, put in solid flooring and restored the walls and brought it back to its original um, size and, and, and condition um, working with um, the Hardlines Design Company, which was a firm that specialized in historic preservation. So um, that's been a labor of a lot of years. And in September of last year was when they unveiled that sign in the front, um, the plaque that recognized it as a, as a house, um, under, as an Ohio Underground Railroad site. So uh, we were just there a few weeks ago and um, we got some pictures of the interior. Um, they've got some great exhibits in there and um, we're going to share some more pictures uh, later on, on our online of, of some of the stuff on there. They have a great timeline um, of local black, black history and this um, wonderful quilt that we've had on display uh, at the Heritage Center before that shows uh, major figures in the community. Uh, and they have, if you know the story of Addison White, um, I am afraid I don't have the story <laughs> included in the talk, um, but they have his trunk over here. Um, he was uh, the, the connection um up there was was with the uh, mechanicsburg i believe but i um you know, can, they've got um, information about that in in the mu museum and I, they're open by appointment i believe at this point but they're always happy to go over there and and, and meet people to let them in and i know that um in the past pre-covid you know they would do school tours and and things like that uh the next person i have here is uh a, a sketch of broadwell chin he was the first African-American to graduate from Springfield High School, very technically, and Wittenberg University. And he was first to, um, to become a member of the Clark County Bar Association. So I say technically because he was actually denied admission, admission to the public high school, but he was tutored um, by the principal and other teachers so that he was allowed to qualify for his diploma. Um, and then he applied to Wittenberg and was rejected by a vote of the student body unfortunately and then but then the board of directors overturned that um, reversed the student vote and admitted him in 1874 uh, and they said that that was not true to the abolitionist attitudes of the founders of Wittenberg and that there should be no race barriers at Wittenberg so he was then admitted and I don't even know if we have this picture in our our collections I think this might have been one that we borrowed from Wittenberg's collections no I, yeah I don't believe we own that Uh, another person uh, that is important to Springfield's history is uh, Dr. Thomas W. Burton. Uh, he was Springfield's first black, black physician. And this was despite the fact that he was born a slave in 1860 in Kentucky and he didn't learn to read until he was 21. Uh, he attended Brea College in Kentucky and then the Eclectic Medical College in Indianapolis. And he moved to Springfield in 1892 and started his medical practice here. Um, he married his wife, Hattie Taylor, here in 1893. Uh, he became a lot of things. First black owner of a local drugstore. He also owned a shoe store, ran a local newspaper for a time. I don't know. If, I'm pretty sure we don't have any of those newspapers. Um, that's another thing that we've been on the look for, out for, local black newspapers that we know existed, but we don't necessarily have represented in our collection. Um, 
during the Spanish American War, he was a surgeon and then uh, later was on the faculty of the Curry School, which I'll talk about a little bit um, in another slide. Uh, in 1897, he helped found the Ohio Mutual Medical Association, and he led an attempt locally to try and start a black hospital. Um, it was supposed to be on South Yellow Springs. And um, we know that there was a building that was either leased or purchased by him, and there was some medical and surgical supplies that were delivered there, um, but there was a, essentially not enough financial support to make it a viable um, venture, so it, didn't, it never went into active operation. Um, and we know that he's the author of two books, which we do not have in our collection, but these pictures are from that book. We borrowed the book from the public library next door, uh, What Experience Has Taught Me, which was an autobiography. Unless, Casey, have we gotten a copy of that book since then? I, I want to say we did. We may I, have I think now. we got I a think, copy I think, of What Experience Has, or, or I, might, I might be thinking of um, a Blaine Henderson Okay, book. but um, another book he did, he did a history of the Underground Railroad, um, which was, it shed the light on the slave experience and he used interviews with his own family members on that book. And I think both of them those might be available, not for circulation, but just to peruse at the public library next to us. Um, but he helped start the, the Colored Elks Lodge in um, Springfield and he was a delegate to the National Negro Business League and a member of uh, North Street AME here in Springfield and where he had raised funds uh, so that needy children could attend Sunday school. And the next slide, I mentioned the Curry School, uh, which he had uh, been a, he had taught there. Um, so the, it was located in Urbana. It was founded in the late 1890s by E. W. B. Curry, uh, who was the pastor of the Second Baptist Church. And he was the founder of an African-American uh, newspaper called The Informer. Um, so Dr. Burton taught there at the Curry School and um, he provided training for, for nurses. And I've got two different dates here. Um, one says that the school was open until 1907, but another one says that it was open until the 1930s. So I think we need to do a little research between our sources here to make sure which one is right there. Um, but the man who founded it, Reverend uh, Elmer B.W. Curry, he had led this new educational um, movement for African-Americans. Uh, he... Uh, looked at the scarcity of educational opportunities that were, uh, were there and he uh, tried to figure out ways to support them. Um, he, he supported the normal industrial school model, which was to prepare students for the workplace. So he had gone to Ohio Wesleyan and he began teaching other African-Americans there in a shed. And then he started, he became the first African-American um, to teach in Delaware County Public Schools. And then in the late 1890s, he opened the Curry School in Mechanicsburg, I believe. And then um, it expanded in, or, in, to our, Urbana, um, and it took people, all, all students from all over the region, all the way up to Canada, and um, he would work with local businesses to help secure jobs for people um, upon completion of their, their training there. Um, and so that's, I think that, I, I'm wondering if Urbana might have a little more information than we have about their, we, our, we have more of the connection because we know Burton and um, uh, Curry were who were both connected to Springfield were there, but I'm I'm wondering if their um, historical society would have more information. So we'll have to do a little more about that. And so I did check uh, I did check Past Perfect real quick, and I, I'm not crazy. We do have a copy of What Experience Has Taught okay. Me by we Dr. Must, Burton, so that's so a we've, nice. We've gotten that since we first did the exhibit because at that we, time we, we had have. to borrow the book because we we didn't have it. Um, we've got a picture of um, Reverend Curry here, and he, um, him and his wife at the uh, Second Missionary Baptist Church, this was the Queen Esther Bible class there, and this is what his wife there in the middle, I believe, and this is a picture of Second Baptist Church. So this next um, slide is some uh, pictures that show the aftermath of a 1904 riot. Um, this is the burning of the Levy neighborhood. So if you're familiar with, um, with Springfield, you can see here the steeple for um, St. Ray's so that if that can help orient you to um, that the Levy neighborhood was, was behind St. Ray Fields. So this was a predominantly um, black neighborhood that was burned uh, following an incident in March, 1904. So in general, across the country from the end of the Civil War to the middle of the 20th century, 
Um, there was a racially motivated violence that was an uh, epidemic in America. And there were racial tensions that were aggravated by a number of factors at the turn of the century. And across the country, there was lynchings and tax race riots that were making headlines. And Springfield was, you know, a powder keg. There was just, you know, waiting for something to happen that would, would spark something like that to happen here. And the first spark was in 1904. Um, there was an incident where a white bailiff, Charles Collis, from the, with the Springfield Police Department was responding to a, a domestic dispute um, and uh, between a, a gentleman and uh, his girlfriend. And the uh, officer, uh, Collis, was, was shot and killed by the, a black man named uh, Richard Dixon. This happened on March 6, 1904. So Dixon was arrested um, right after, but um, not long after that, that, um, that same day, a mob stormed the jail and dragged him out and took their own justice. They hung him from a utility pool pole at the corner of Fountain and Main Street downtown. Um, and then the following night, they formed again and they burned the neighborhood, as, which is the pictures that you see here. Um, and uh, the riot didn't end until the Ohio governor sent the National Guard to intervene. Um, and our, our primary sources on this are very interesting. It's all in the newspapers, but you can imagine that the coverage is very, uh, very slanted. And um, we have some diaries um, that are always a, a great resource for um, looking at what's going on in Springfield. Um, but you can see that the gentleman who, was, who mentioned the riots in the diary said that he sided with the rioters who burned down the neighborhood and, and hung uh, Mr. Dixon. So you can see the the tensions that are that were there um, expressed. Um, and that incident showed that um, the, there was deep racial hatred in Springfield during the Reconstruction era and then the turn of the century. And it also showed how little the city's courts were willing to do to help control it. Um, his Dix, Mr. Dixon's family had sought compensation under the state's anti-lynching laws, and they could have gotten up to $5,000, um, but they received $125, 80 of which went to their lawyers. So they did not get, get justice for that. Um, and you can read, there's a lot more about this. Um, Darnell Carter uh, is, a, a, I believe, a, a retired attorney, uh, or, more, maybe, or, still, or possibly still practicing, that he um, has two recorded talks, which I think um, if you wanted to hear more about um, the specifics of this, and there was also an incident in 1906, and I'll talk more about one um, in, in 1921, but there's a recorded talk, um, and I believe Saylor has those links, um, that he did a talk in 2019, a two-part one here in town. Um, the recording of that's online, so we can we can share that in the chat tonight. And also he has a, a, a thesis that he wrote um, specifically about um, those events using primary sources and just uh, talking about <laughs> What, what that showed about the time period. So you, if you're interested in those, we'll, we'll share those in the links tonight in the chat as well. So there's a lot more to be learned about that. There's a student that's been coming in the last couple of weeks from um, Wright State and another one coming in from Wittenberg who are both doing research on, on the topic. So um, a lot of what we have to offer them are the primary source um, newspaper materials. But um, I know that the one student is working on um, trying to get uh, Ohio historical marker application done um, to um, mark the spot downtown um, connected with uh, Mr. Dixon's death. So um, she'll be probably um, getting more assistance from the, the resources that we have in our archives for, for that. Um, a person that was directly connected with that and who also just played a, a, an important role in, um, in the, our history was Sully James. He was the first um, black lawyer in town. He opened his practice in 1903 and he was a tireless activist for equal rights. He represented primarily black clients, including he had uh, represented Richard Dixon, um, the lynching victim of the riot. And um, he also represented other African-Americans that were indicted in the later um, 1906 riot and um, 1921. So, so he would offer his, his services free of charge if clients couldn't pay. We've got his office downtown on, um, on Fountain, I believe, here's the picture. Um, 
and he was uh, active within the community. He was on the original board of directors for the Center Street Y, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, he was a trustee at Wilberforce University and the um, lodge officer for the Prince Hall Masons. And we have his tuxedo on display down on the, the first floor in the um, museum. Another person that was connected to um, the 1921 incident that did not lead to um, a riot and death was uh, Chatfield Patterson. He was a successful funeral director who was active in the black community in Springfield. And um, he was instrumental in stopping a repeat of the events in 1904 and 1906. This is a picture with the Beth Sitta Bible class from North Street AME. Um, you can see him here. And this is, I think, from um, Probably uh, the got, Center Street Y. Yeah, this, which is a, a later campaign, but, I think. Yeah, yeah. Wait, and I have that other picture later. Uh, but when observing the growing racial strife across the country after the end of World War One, he concluded that blacks in Springfield might uh, face a similar fate like they had at the turn of the century. Um, and to be, avoid that, they had to be prepared to fight. So he met with Sully James and other some fellow undertakers and um, other business owners, um, black business owners, and they decided to raise money for weapons that could be distributed among local blacks to train them um, for their use. So in the fall of 1919, after they had raised some money, Patterson, who uh, was very light skinned and could pass as white, traveled to an army depot and purchased uh, surplus Springfield rifles. And 20, 1920 passed without incident. Uh, in 1921, there was another uh, spark that ignited events um, but things ended differently that time. Um, in March 1921, there was an alleged attack um, on a young girl by an unknown black man. Um, we've never gotten the full story of if, of, of, of you know, who was involved or if, if um, what, what the details were there. But the news spread quickly and a white mob formed to go um, attack black neighborhoods. Um, and this time they were met by um, armed men who turned them back. Um, and luckily there was, there was, at that time there was no deaths and there was no neighborhoods being burned. Uh, so that was uh, an example, a good example of, you know, there was not, there was not violence um, after that. Uh, this is a picture of the Center Street Y. And I was trying today to figure out, Casey, if we have a picture of the Y before that, because I, I went back further and realized that the earlier Center Street Y was on the exact same location, but I don't know if we have a picture of the, the early one, but this is the, the one that was built in 1950. And um, so this is where in, in our exhibit, we tell the, the story of that um, just for associations or clubs um, that were started uh, specifically for the black community was because, well, they, they couldn't get into the, any of the white organizations. Um, but they had different problems to address. So really, I mean, it, um, the, the, so they formed their own societies or branches of white societies that existed in town, like with the Y, um, for a place for social uplift, economic assistance, and to, to be able to gather together to fight discrimination and injustice. So a lot of those movements were born here. Um, Springfield had its own social welfare organizations and uh, branches of the national ones. Uh, so the Center Street Y here was started out in 1890 as the Young Men's Reading and Social Club, and it was officially incorporated in 1906. So it was separate from the other Y, um, which at that time would have been in downtown um, at uh, Fountain and Main. So this uh, the Center Street Y served a central role for Springfield's African American community. So it was a haven where young people could learn and enjoy themselves in a positive atmosphere, and a meeting place for the community. So before this one was built, uh, there was an attempt in the 1940s to combine with the women's Center Street, um, or I'm sorry, Clark Street, YWCA. Uh, but the New York office of the Y said that segregation would not, not likely go on that much longer so that there was no need to, um, to, com to combine the two and build a, a different organization. But eventually they ended up buying, building the YMCA. So I think that says a little bit more about their <laughs> feelings also about what men needed versus, you know, a better one for combined for men and women. Um, so they didn't have the merger. They just, they built a new one. I believe the Clark, the Clark women's branch stayed open for, for um, 
much longer. And we've got some pictures here showing the interior when it opened in 1950. Uh, and it still stands today. I believe it'll be in the paper tomorrow as the as a then and now picture. So because um, I had sent a little bit about the history of it. Um, but this was part of the this brochure here was part of the uh, what they were using to raise funds to to build the new Y. And uh, we've got a few materials like this. And then um, when it closed, I think all the Ys were facing financial distress in the 1970s. And then the Center Street branch closed at that time. And then in 1980, it reopened as the Center Street Community Center. And I'm not entirely sure how long that was there, but it was run by the Springfield Urban League at that point. So we've got, uh, this is a 1939 membership campaign for the Y. And we've got, um, I believe, yeah, there's Chatfield Patterson there. Probably the shortest, one of the shortest people in this photo, aside from the children standing next to the tallest man in the photo, Alonzo Moss, which is um, in our next slide. We're going to talk a little bit more about him. Um, he was very instrumental in the Center Street Y and in the community. Uh, he was born in 1911 in Springfield and was um, six of seven sons and one daughter. And he went to Fulton elementary central middle school and he was the star athlete athlete and an honor student at springfield high school um graduating with the class of 1931 so we've got um this basketball photo down there and he was this part of here was the the center street high y um and he was the advisor uh, at that time um over here on the left um so after graduating from Springfield High School, he went to West Virginia's Bluefield Teachers College and then returned to Springfield in 1936. Um, and in February of that year, he started working for the Center Street Y as the uh, program and physical director because uh, his mom had gotten him involved there where she was a volunteer. So that was um, something he returned to. Uh, in 1942, he was appointed to the executive secretary and um, he served as their one man staff with uh, volunteers for, for a number of years, but um, helped raise 300,000 for the new facility that opened in 1950. And uh, he served at the Center Street Y for 25 years. And then in 1960, he was recruited to help revive the East Baltimore YMCA. So he went there for a few years and then later became executive of the Baltimore uh, Metropolitan YMCA, which he was there until 1975. And he passed away in 2010 in Maryland. Oh, I just noticed somebody in this picture. I was just thinking that we didn't have um, one person that's missing from our collections is um, Mayor uh, Bob Burton, but I just noticed that he's in this picture in the third row. So I think he, so that's, that's good to know. <laughs> I didn't, I just noticed his name right as I was clicking. So um, a lot of people will probably have to go through yearbooks and things like that to find more pictures of them. Um, but I'm sure, you know, families are out there that, that can give us pictures as well. Uh, and while we're on the topic of um, the, the why and, and um, recreation related things, um, I want to talk about Brooks Lawrence. Uh, he was born in um, 1925 in Springfield and uh, to Wilbur and Patsy Walker Lawrence, who were sharecroppers uh, who had moved north to find a better life. Um, his siblings called him little brother, but his uh, neighborhood friends dubbed him Brooks. Um, he was, he was Ulysses was his, his actual first name. Um, and uh, Brooks was the nickname that stuck with him all through his life and his baseball career. Uh, he learned to play with the Sandlot teams in Springfield in the summers. And initially he shied away from playing at Springfield High School, um, playing baseball. And he, he later recalled that it was an unwritten rule um, that uh, blacks were excluded from, from baseball. But he did end up joining his senior year. But before that, he excelled in basketball and track, and he became the first African-American quarterback at the school. So he excelled in all the sports. Um, after he graduated, he served in World War II. Uh, he joined the Miners in 1948 and then was called up to the St. Louis Cardinals in 1954. And that year, he was named um, 1940 News Magazines uh, to their rookie all-star team. And the following year, he suffered from a bleeding ulcer and was had long recuperation. So he was let go from the Cardinals during that time, but he was uh, picked up by the Reds. So we see him here. 
in his Reds uniform that he bought out, bought his contract. Um, another nickname he had was the Bull because of his durability and um, as a pitcher. And he was considered the winningest pitcher in the National League and made the National All-Star team that year when he was first picked up by the Reds. Um, towards the end of the 56 season, he was going into winning 19 games. He asked the manager, Bertie Tibbetts, when he was going to get his next start. And Tibbetts said, Brooks, no black man will ever win 20 games for me. And although he was healthy, uh, he was held out of action for the final weeks of the season and never did get his um, 20th win. Um, he retired in 1960 with 69 wins and 62 losses, and he uh, became part of the Reds administration, working with pitchers uh, and on their speakers bureau. And he died in uh, 2000. So we have his... I don't have pictures of this, but we've had it on the, on the display before. We have his uniform and his shoes, I believe, and his one of his um, baseball mitts, I think. Another sports figure um, that's very well known is um, world champion boxer Davey Moore. Uh, he was born in Kentucky in 1933, and, um, and he and his six siblings were raised in Springfield. So he began, he began boxing like this, this picture here, he's, he looks very, very young. Um, the one on the left, I am always struck by how young he looks in that picture. Um, as an amateur boxer, he won 120 of 125 bouts and became an Olympian in 1952. Um, he held the featherweight champion of the world title from 1959 to 1963 and was nicknamed the Springfield Rifle. Uh, and he had a very impressive record, 59 wins, um, had 30 knockouts, seven losses, one draw, and one no contest. Um, but tragically, he died in uh, March 25th, 1963. So uh, these pictures are here from the anniversary of several years ago where we had done some programs at the Heritage Center, um, the anniversary of his death in, in March. But he died from injuries suffered during his last title fight against uh, Sugar Ramos. And uh, he left behind his uh, five children and his wife, Geraldine. And she, this, um, I believe this was just lent for the exhibit, but that's still, um, Geraldine is still, has still held on to that. Um, and he's buried in, in Ferncliff Cemetery. And there's a, a, he was immortalized in song by Bob Dylan, who killed Davy Moore. And um, he now has, I'm not sure when the statue actually went up, but over here is the picture of, um, Mike Major with the statue that stands across um, the median from um, Springfield High School or Springfield South High School, whichever you want to call it, by the dome um, over on the on the south side of town. Yeah, you have the statue there and it was dedicated in uh, 2013. I believe these were these were other things we had on on display during the exhibit. But those were reproduction pieces of, aside from the, the, the metal here and this belt. Another person that is um, not very, not very well known. Um, he was a contemporary poet to Dayton's Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who was much more well known. Um, this is Elliot Blaine Henderson. Uh, he was born 1877 uh, to Benjamin Franklin Henderson and Sarah Henderson. He was educated in the Clark County Schools and began his writing career here in Springfield. Um, and there were local leaders like Asa Bushnell and Sam O'Shellabarter who supported his writing aspirations. He published his first book of poetry, um, Plantation Echoes, which we have a collection of, I think, all of his books, possibly, um, in, in the archives. Um, he published Plantation Echoes in 1904 and 1905 and self-published um, the other volumes. Um, he was the sole editor, sole editor and owner of the Columbus Recorder, the only colored newspaper in Columbus, Ohio at that time. Um, that's one we, again, don't have, but I'm, I'm hoping that the Ohio History Connection may have some of those in, uh, as that's um, their area. Uh, he wrote poems in standard verse and form in the styles of the day, but he also wrote in dialect. So you see some examples of that here, um, which um, intentionally uh, misspelled in order to imitate the non-standard style of speech. Um, so he... he uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar also wrote some of his poetry in the, the style as well. Um, 
but it was immensely popular among white readers at the time and was later criticized for being, well, for playing into stereotypes. Uh, but you can see we have, you know, a lot of the books um, and, uh, that, that he had, and you can see in, throughout them, he goes back and forth between the different um, styles of writing. Um, but like I said, he's not, not, not really known today, um, but his works have been cited by in different academic works as possibly as forms of protest. You know, they say it's playing into the, um, the stereotype, but you know, that, that it was his, his way of, 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 of sort of protesting those stereotypes. Um, he died in Columbus in 1944. Staying with the, the art theme, but um, put, them, put them both together on this um, uh, slide here. Uh, we have Ada Lee, who uh, when we, we first got this record, uh, I think Bob maybe was the one who brought this to us. I can't remember, Bob, you're on here. Um, I apologize if I, if I have that wrong, but um, we were doing some more research on Ada Lee and realized that she is, in fact, Johnny Lytle's sister. It's not mentioned in either of their biographical materials, but they did have the same parents. They're in the census together at the same time. Um, so she was born to uh, Robert Breston and Margaret Strickland Lytle in 1927. And um, so it was a, a very musical family, the, the Lytle family. Um, uh, the father was a professional musician, played trumpet in his own band, and um, their mother was a singer, organist, and pianist. So um, we've got Ada over here, and um, her brother was Johnny Lytle, who was a, a famous jazz musician and vibraphonist. Um, more about Ada, she trained um, in junior high and did intensive study with teachers here in Springfield. In high school, she um, sang on the weekends and was on local radio programs and she later sang with bands in Dayton and Cincinnati and this is here um, I mentioned about black newspapers we had the Springfield Post which um, we have it because the um, Springfield Public Library or Clark County Public Library had um, a bound copy of these papers um, from 1956 and I have the date wrong on there. I'm sorry. It's 19. I, the text says 64, but it's actually 56. Um, the, is the, we have the entire 1956 paper for the year. We don't know if more exists. So that's something that we definitely want to do some more research on and see if more, if that paper had a longer run. Um, but we never had any in our collection until we got it from um, the library and they didn't have any more in their collection either. But on the very front page of the paper, when we first got it and they brought it over to us, she was on the front at a Count Basie show, which was something that we had looked up and saw that she had done. But then when this came, we said, oh, there she is at the show. So um, so that was a really great find um, to help put those put those things together. Um, she uh, studied at the Dayton Conservatory, Conservatory of Music. And then um, during that time, she went on a talent show on WHIO and was awarded a scholarship to study uh, music further at Wilberforce University. Um, so she did that, and then she left Wilberforce, stayed in Ohio for a little bit, um, saying this Count Basie show here that's <laughs> that's pictured. Uh, and then uh, in the 60s, she ended up uh, moving to Canada. And I did not, I meant to look today to see if she was still alive, but last, she in 2014, she had moved to a performing arts lodge um, for retirees. Um, that had been in the performing arts in Vancouver. Um, and she was still alive when I wrote about this, I think two or three years ago, but I forgot to look to see if she's, if she's still with us. Um, oh, I jumped ahead again, I'm sorry. To go back to her brother, um, he was again, born into a musical family. He went on to record more than 40 albums. Um, but he started out as a boxer like Davey Moore. I believe they boxed together, um, were in that same uh, time frame. Uh, but he eventually uh, became a drummer, landing jobs um, with various people, including uh, he played with Ray Charles for a time before turning to the vibraphone. So he was known as Fast Hands for his speed on the vibraphone. Um, and he was, he was very talented. He died in 1995. And we, we have his, um, a set of his vibes here at the, at the Heritage Center. Um, but he felt a uh, social responsibility towards his hometown and wanted to bring um, 
music, sports, and cultural events to the south, the what he the disadvantaged south side of town um, through the Davy Moore Cultural Center. So his intention was to eventually have a museum there and, and cultural center, but sadly it was destroyed by a fire um, before that could happen. And a lot of the material that had been gathered there um, for that museum was destroyed as well. So that's that's a sad part of, of our local history to think about what, what may have been lost there. You can hear it, right? Is it over with? Must be over with now. Yeah. How long was it? Like 30 minutes? No, it's going to be longer than 30 minutes. Oh. But if Here we go. Okay. This next slide is a... <laughs> It was it was really hard to to figure out how to um, stop John Legend's bio um, here. Uh, so my my favorite part about him, if 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 you know John Legend, is in our collection we have the uh, we have the newspapers from the Springfield News Sun, and they have uh, uh, people files for various people, and his folder said John Stevens, spelling bee winner. And then there was this you know, cute little picture of little fourth grade uh, John Stevens winning the spelling bee and, and picture of him with his with his mother here. Um, and 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 then next to that is a little carrot written, a.k.a. John Legend, R&B superstar. So I love it. You know, whoever was doing the clipping at the paper decided to go ahead and edit that folder. Uh, to to indicate uh, who 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 he became. So we've got some other things from our archives in his his file. Um, we've got uh, when his when his little brother was born. Um, no wait, this was when this was when he was born. Uh, his brother Ronald, older brother, was at the um, hospital with him. He was born December twenty eighth, nineteen seventy eight. So this is. Um, the first time they were allowing children to visit their siblings there. So he happened to be the, his brother happened to be the first one that was allowed to visit. So he made it in the paper right after he was born. Um, we have his uh, Springfield North High class of 1995 uh, picture here, which interestingly has our uh, recently retired director of collection, Virginia's son, uh, right next to him, right near him in the picture as well. Um, but uh, so his story, he comes from, again, uh, like the like the Lytles, a musical family. Uh, he, his mother was the choir director and soloist at the El Bethel Temple on Clifton Avenue. And he, according to her, his first words were hallelujah. Uh, he asked to start piano lessons at age four, joined the church choir at seven. And by 11, he was helping uh, director Park Oliver uh, direct the community choir. He was homeschooled until he was six. Then he went to Springfield Christian School on Home Road uh, before returning back to homeschooling for grades four to six. So when he won the spelling bee, he was homeschooled at that point. Uh, he went to Schaefer Middle School and then jumped ahead two years to start um, at Springfield North High um, at a very young age. Uh, he ended up graduating at age 16. So he was always an overachiever. Um, he began to focus more on his musical career in the early 2000s. Um, released his first album in 2004. Uh, that same year he came back and he played the Springfield Arts Festival, which I know they would love to get him back. <laughs> but again, with COVID and them worrying about things, that would probably be the biggest crowd draw that they've ever had. So maybe not right now, but maybe someday he would come back and play. Um, and he came back for shows um, in, in 2005 and six locally. Um, 2006 was when he got all of his Grammy nominations for his debut album, and he ended up winning um, Best New Artist in 2006. Um, he returned to put John Legend Theater on his picture there. Theater. Yes. Do I not? The theater is should be there. Oh, I think yeah, it's by both of them. But yes, this is him at the dedication of the John Legend Theater, which was yeah, in. Yeah. His um, grandmother also died recently. Did yeah, you know? she just she died this past week, I believe. Yeah. Um, and she was still local, and I believe he uh, he still has local family here. Um, he helped raise money for the John Legend Theater renovations, and and he was here for the dedication. So this is shown here uh, playing at that uh, dedication in 2016. Um, but he helped raise he don't he donated himself five hundred thousand dollars for those efforts. So if you guys have ever been to anything at the newly restored John Legend Theater, it's fantastic, and um, it's really good to have be able to have shows back in there again. Um, 
He married Chrissy Teigen in 2013, and they have the two most adorable kids you could ever see. Um, his his son Miles is like his little mini me, so basically looks like this little guy here pretty much. Um, but he's and he's still done a lot in the last few years. Um, he was uh, played the role of Jesus in Jesus Christ Superstar in um, on Easter Sunday in 2018, which was a fantastic show. Um, we, we were watching that at my house, and uh, that won him a primetime Emmy. So he became the first African American man to earn the EGOT honor. He had won an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. So that is a very major distinction. Um, and then, you know, I don't know how the man has time to do everything, but he yeah, had a new Christmas album a few couple of years ago. He's on The Voice um, as a voice coach. Um, he was named People's Magazine Sexiest Man Alive a couple of years ago, and in 2020, he released another album in the midst of a pandemic and all of this. Um, so, yeah, he's he's a. Uh, we're excited to see more of what he does and to add more to to the archives of articles about him and, and things that he's doing. So, well, he's got a lot of rooted in a lot of history here, but he's he's doing a lot. So, it'll be interesting to see where he goes. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about um, the Fulton School, um, which was the current Fulton School is over off of um, on South Yellow Springs, right? South Yellow Springs. Yeah. So the original Fulton School, which was uh, was on Dibert Avenue. So it was originally called Dibert School um, and it opened in 1884. Um, 1913, it was renamed Fulton Elementary after John Fulton, who was a former teacher and principal at Western School and the first principal of Springfield High. Um, Fulton had been instrumental in the establishment of the city's public schools and was an early advocate of school integration. So that's why there's some irony with this story about Fulton School. Um, the irony was that in 1922, the school board voted to reopen the newly renovated Fulton as a fully segregated school, which was A, against the law and against what a lot of the community wanted. Um, at the time, the law pro prohibited school segregation, even though many in schools in Ohio did have them. Um, Springfield City Schools were among the few in the state that didn't have schools specifically segregated by race, um, but the superintendent wanted, the, wanted them to be that way, so he devised a plan that would make it happen. He knew that there were people in the community that wanted Black teachers to be in the classroom, so they said that Black teachers could be hired, but it had to be an all-Black school, so they proposed that Fulton be that school. So at that time, there was 300 members from the Black community that signed a petition supporting that plan. Um, they felt that that might allow for some different educational opportunities um, and lead to more jobs in the field. But the um, Springfield NAACP had countered with 1,000 signatures against the plan, saying that this is wrong. You know, keeping the school, um, putting the school segregation in place is wrong. Um, they, hoard, they supported the hiring of black teachers, but they said the notion of the segregated school, they couldn't, they couldn't stand by that. I need so, to refer to that article I so, said you wrote down. Uh, so there was, uh, the school board voted to reopen the school for the 1922 school year as a black school only, and protests began soon after that. Um, they were led by the Civil Rights Protection League, and there was a number of, number of figures in the black community that were part of that, including Sully James and Dr. Burton. Um, and a couple people we'll talk about in the next slide, Hattie, Hattie Mosley and um, Edna Bacon. Um, so the, the group led protests to encourage parents to register their children at other schools. Um, and there was attorneys that were able to obtain a temporary injunction against the board saying, but the board refused to reassign white students to that school. Um, so the judge eventually ruled that they had imposed illegal segregation and that they must either close and redistribute the children until the next school year or give the children the choice of attending any school. So they decided to do that and let the children attend any school they wanted. Um, so eventually McCord, the superintendent, left firing all the black teachers at Fulton um, despite their good performance. And it would be more than 20 years before another black teacher would be hired at all in the whole district. Um, but so even though the board decision officially was not to segregate the school, there was de facto segregation that lasted well, for years to come. I mean, still as a South Side school, um, we talk a little bit about this in the exhibit, the, the redlining and, and de facto segregation that, that occurs uh, across town. I mean, 
Um, so, so Fulton is still predominantly um, a black school, just it's, uh, with the makeup of the, the neighborhood there. And two of the people that were instrumental in um, those protests and just in general um, civil rights um, in, in Springfield was Hattie Mosley on the left. Um, this is a sketch by um, David Catro, who is a um, well-known artist and who used to work for the Springfield News Sun. Um, she came from Georgia in the 1920s and quickly became active in those efforts. So she was right here, right when, when that was happening with Fulton School. Um, she banded together with different ministers from the different uh, black churches in, in the area and tried to use um, threat of economic boycott to get white owned businesses on the South end to hire African-American workers. Um, she later turned her sights on different utilities, banks, department stores, and government offices to end employment discrimination. There was a Woolworths lunch counter sit-in in 1949. She was part of um, organizing that and she organized different demonstrations at restaurants, hotels, and theaters in town to um, desegregate them. Uh, another thing that she um, she had set up a Democratic Party club and ran voter registration drives to give African Americans a stronger voice in civic affairs. And she would organize caravans to the polls to make sure that everybody had the um, chance to exercise the right to vote. A lot of what we're seeing today, too, that helps to get the vote out. So she was well ahead of her time. Um, Dorothy Bacon, unfortunately, we do have another picture of her that I think was in that Newsweek article that mentioned the Bacons, but this is her uh, a young Edna Bacon. Um, she was a tire, another tireless advocate for the rights of others. Um, her husband was wrongfully laid off um, from his depression era WPA job. So she wrote to Roosevelt, asked him to be reinstated. Um, in the 50s, she worked with Hattie Mosley and uh, she picketed the Liberty Theater on High Street, which was a segregated theater. Um, and she attempted to open it to the, the black community. Um, she helped uh, black politicians uh, get elected and was herself elected secretary of the NAACP and she was committee one for the Democratic Party. Um, she would help underprivileged children drive them to school in her husband's work truck and she was um, another one that challenged the de facto segregation in Springfield schools. Um, another person in town that, that ended up uh, breaking that that color barrier was Robert, um, Robert C. Henry. He uh, eventually became uh, the mayor of uh, Springfield for a couple of years. He was um, became uh, the, part of the Springfield City Commission in 1961 and um, won a second term on the commission. And then um, there they were direct, you're directly elected at the time. Now you're directly elected as mayor, but he was elected by the other commissioners um, to become mayor, which he served for, for two years. Um, and at that time, the Springfield's population was 83,000 and change, which was made him the first black mayor of a size of a city of that size in the country. Um, so he served from 1966 to 68 and stayed on the commission for um, a while after that. Um, he was head of Robert C. Henry Funeral Home, which still in, I think it's still active um, over on, I think, off of Yellow Springs, um, or on Yellow Springs. In 1972, he was the Republican Party nominee for our district, um, but he did, um, he lost that. Um, but we've got the, this, I love this great picture of him um, when it was still the city building, our building, um, where he would have served. Um, and in uh, 2009, part of South Center Street, oh, I guess, I'm sorry, the, the funeral home is on South Center Street. I got the streets mixed up. Um, part of the street was renamed Robert C. Henry Way. He died in uh, 1981, is buried in Franklin. So there's a lot of things, I know it's getting, it's getting later, I'm, I'm, uh, there's a, so much more we can do, but one of the last slides I have shows one of our um, locally owned black businesses, um, the Burton Hotel, which was um, originally opened in 1917 as the Hotel Montgomery run by John Montgomery. Um, so that was, at that time, it was one of the first locally owned and run black hotels in Springfield. Um, changed hands a few times over the years, became the Hotel Burton in the 1940s, owned by um, Edward Burton. Um, his nephew was Bob Burton, who later became mayor. And um, 
there's an article that Tom Stafford did about this a number of years ago about the entertainment that was there. It was one of the most prominent places that people, uh, Blacks could go for entertainment. They had people like Duke Ellington, Cab Calloway, Count Basie, um, and Johnny Lytle would play there. Um, so it was located where KK Tool is now on South Center Street, directly across from the uh, west side of our building um, across the street. So KK Tool, um, well, it was closed in 1970s when it was known as the Guy Hotel and um, torn down in the eight, no, 1980s and KK Tool is built on the foundations of the old um, hotel. But we got, this is another collection where we didn't have a lot of the stuff in our own collection, but we worked with the family to get some photos and, and um, things connected with the hotel that we were able to borrow or reproduce um, for exhibits or to be able to share with later um, researchers. So that's, that's something too. If people don't want to give up their um, materials, we will make reproductions of things or scans because sometimes, especially if it's history, that that's the only way we can help document that history. We're happy to do it that way if people don't want to give um, stuff away. Um, so, you know, to build, to put this exhibit together and expand it like we did in 2012, we did do a lot of working with people in the community to help to tell some of those stories. So um, that's something we're always happy to do. Um, of course, we're, we're happy if people will, will want, want to donate this stuff as well, but the more important thing is to be able to tell the story. So um, I think that's all I have, but I've got some pictures of the current exhibit up now. Um, one of the clubs that is featured there is the, um, the Lynx and they, Casey, if you can tell a little bit more, this is a part of a uh, oral history project they did of interviews. In past years, we've had the interviews able to be played, but right now um, we just have these um, uh, standing uh, things that kind of give you a little summary of what, what they talked about with those people and their importance to the community. Um, we talked about some other um, African-American uh, organizations like LIFM, the charities, and, and uh, are also in, in the exhibit, but I didn't get to talk too much about tonight. And there's a lot more about um, religious, uh, but, but different churches too, that we don't, we don't have here necessarily. And this here, I this forgot, um, Thelma Burton, she was Edward Burton's wife. Um, she had a, a salon that we, we featured on our Facebook this, this uh, last day, we, we, as our what is it, we had her um, sauna cabinet. Um, kind of hot box thing that most people thought was an iron lung because it really does look a lot like one. Um, but that's a, another piece of, of the local history that we have to represent the, the salon that she had on um, Fair Street. So I, you guys can, let me see, let me stop sharing. Um, oh, and in the chat, um, Sailor's also shared a link to Ada Lee music so you can hear her sing if you'd like. Um, so we've got the, the thesis and, and the two recorded speeches on there. Um, it looks like as of last May, she's still alive. Oh, okay. So she is still, okay. Yeah. I meant to, I, I figured, well, she was born in the early 20s or late 20s. So I thought, yeah. Um, I know that we had found an interview with her, one of her nephews at one point. So we, I had talked to Roger that if she is still around, she might be someone that we want to talk to because she, there's not really anybody else connected to that family or, or you know, and, and well, to be able to ask her about Johnny too, if, if they are in fact, if we're right that they were in fact siblings. Um, yeah, she lives in Vancouver now. So the wonders of Google. I was surprised when I first started doing research on her and found that she was still alive at the time. Uh, so yeah, if you guys have any other questions, um, one more link that I'm, I'd ask Sailor if she could share. Uh, we have two uh, donation links if you if you want to donate. We actually did a fundraiser uh, last Saturday. We started because it was the 131st anniversary of our building. So we thought <laughs> we, we put a little a fundraiser up on Facebook. So what we've got, she's got the links to um, to our Facebook and our other page if you wanted to um, help us reach our goal there. I'm sure Roger would be very ecstatic if you mm -hmm. if you did that. Um, but we'll, we'll share the links for you there. Hey, um, Natalie, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. All the links that Sailor is posting, how can we access them after this um, event? I can... I was afraid to click on them that I well, would if lose you, if what you, we were... 
I think if you click on them, it opens them in another tab. Yes. I have them all in another window. Okay, you do? Yeah, okay. so, they, yeah. so you, you can open them that way. We'll give a little bit of time if you guys want to open them up, but I can always post them later in the um, in the event page or uh, when we put the videos up, we can all I'll make okay. sure that we include that um, okay. when, we, when we convert this one. Thank um, you. But if, but if you're interested, here's your window. Click on the links. <laughs> Open them in separate tabs. So. Hey, Natalie, this is Dick Graber. I uh, came in about uh, sub-15. And when you were just talking about the race riots, I took a uh, course from uh, Ward Copeland at Whitburg mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago. And he had us read a paper about the race riots back those uh, three days yeah. yeah, back in the early 20th century. And he did actually consider the one in 1921 a riot, even oh. though nothing uh, destructive occurred from it. Yeah, there were, there were some injuries too, but yeah, there was definitely people coming together. Um, the, the paper you read may have been Darnell Carter's thesis. It, yeah, which um, is what, which we've linked here too. Um, the only good source I know of about the 1921 riot um, that doesn't get quite as much play yeah. as the and first. we haven't I and this is something that we we need to do on our own some some more research to go print um, or go through some of the the microfilm because I know that I'd gone through and tried to print mm -hmm. as much as I could find on the 1904 riots so that we could have it in a folder to, to save people some time uh, uh, looking for some of that information. But I don't think we haven't done it with the 1906 and the 1921 to go through and get everything. We've got full, we've got some information in the folders, but not, but not all of it. Um, well, and that I found it's easier uh, to share as well. And the 1921 riot was actually misreported in, I'd, I'd have to go back and check, but it was a New York paper um, that uh, I think it said there were 16 casualties or something like that. Um, Oh Wait. goodness! Yeah, so that's uh, yeah, <laughs> that's Natalie. Papers yeah. are... You were you were talking about uh, Davy Moore. Mm -hmm. I, I I never knew Davy, but I knew his brother Nate pretty well. Now you can figure, Davy was what 112 pounds or 115 pounds. Nate was about five eight and two thirty five. Mm -hmm. And he would be, today, he would be classed as a professional caddy. He always caddied at the country club for Steve Zappi, the pro. And when Steve went on the golf course, Nate was on the bag. <laughs> and it was, a, it was always a, a, a story out there that Nate carried four bags at a time for did, 18 holes. Did he, did he stay in town or did he end up moving elsewhere? No, no, no. He he stayed here. He died here. Yeah. He was about, uh, I'd say, six years or maybe seven years older than Davy. Mm -hmm. And another little thing, uh, you a person you don't know, is Lucinda Kelly. Lucinda Kelly was the first black realtor in Springfield. Now, I was told this by her youngest son, Chuck. Okay. Uh, Chuck lives out on Possum Road yet. He, he would be uh, 88, 89, same age as me. And uh, he has, uh, I think they had seven kids or three of them went to school with me, died, uh, Dorothy, uh, Clarence, and Chuck. And he never met a stranger. And, uh, <laughs> never met a stranger. And so it might be, uh, you know, give Chuck a call. Okay. And, yeah, uh, I, I'll write that down. We'll make sure. Yeah. And that's that's the other uh, there, there, uh, collections that we have in the archives are um, some people that I didn't mention that we've got uh, um, Ernestine Lucas. She yeah, you know, yeah. We have a great collection of hers um, that she was a genealogist, but she also just collected a lot having to do with the black community. So that helps our collection so much, mm -hmm. um, what she saved. And, Bel and Belva Bell, her daughter, Alice, had donated all her materials to us. So that covers a lot of no, I don't know. a lot of churches and people and, and that we never had anything on before. So um, we're always trying to, to grow the information that we have. And that's why I always try look to see what people are posting 
um, like especially Tim Ayers to see, you know, he always mentions people that I've never heard of that we can, you know, do more research on and make sure that we include in future things like this and try and, and, and have represented in what we have. Um, but real quick, before we go, I wanted to mention, I don't know if anybody participated in any of the book, um, the citywide book uh, club that they had where they had three different books that people could read. They had um, uh, White Fragility, which Patty, I swear I'm gonna get this back to you. Um, and <laughs> and uh, Me and White Supremacy, which I, I, took, I took part in a book club that read this book. Um, and, it, and it talks about hard conversations that, um, about about race and and racism and that um talks about implicit biases that we have ourselves as as people that are white and how to overcome those and and i i my my goal with um reading uh, this one specifically um was that i just felt as as a person that works at a historical society i need to understand better um well how to how to how to understand people how to talk to people but also how to just get past my own um biases that I might have. Um, so it was a very, um, I'm still talking with my book group about it. We're, we're wrapping it up um, this week, um, but it's been a very helpful exercise. So I recommend if you didn't get more part of those book groups, you could still read the books. They're still very helpful um, and, and a good thing just to make yourself understand the world around you a little bit better. So I, I recommend them very highly. Um, and I know that um, the woman who wrote this one, um, Layla Sad, she um, I, I listened to a genealogy or a museum conference, but they talked about the, the main theme of that conference, which is a very main theme of her book is um, what kind of ancestor do you want to be? So about bettering yourself so that you're leaving the world behind you better so that people, you know, understanding it around you, better, uh, the world around you and interacting with people around you um, in, in a better way. So I thought that those were really good themes that they carried through that museum conference I was at and that carried through in her book. So I thought that, uh, myself working with, with local history that I wanted to, to better understand that too, because I know that our collections are, are not complete because they, they don't tell the whole story. So anything that we can do to connect with the community to be able to tell that is good. So. Natalie, could I make another comment? There's, yeah. I've been, uh, as a science uh, interest, I uh, went to National Aeronautic Space Administration, uh, NASA.gov, uh, NASA TV, and they've done a thorough uh, showing the entire month about black history uh, in the National Aeronautic Space Administration. So if anybody wants to uh, check that out, I think it's still going on, uh, you can do that. That's NASA.gov. Uh, and get on NASA TV. Yeah, that's a that's a really great resource. Thanks, Dick. Um, so, yeah, can I, I know ask, my can I ask Flossie a question? What, what day are you in the, the office, Flossie? She'll Flossie? be in tomorrow. Tomorrow's Thursday. She'll be in tomorrow. Are you, are you in the Thursday? I'm, in, I'm, we're not, I'm not really in the office. I'm in the library. You come and go out of, out of our office. Where, that's where we eat. She's there Wednesdays and Thursdays. Wednesday and Thursday. Okay, so if I come up, can I come up this sometime? I need. I want to look at my folder, my family folder again for something. Okay, come in tomorrow. We we get there a little after ten, and we stay till about three. Okay. But I'm so I didn't hear what you said. They're there till about three. Okay. We come in Thank a little you. after ten. Okay. And we stay till about three. It's a little, right. a little bit better than bankers hours. <laughs> <laughs> he just offended Patty. <laughs> I want to know where Casey is. Put the background behind Casey up there. Casey's got Crow Collier behind her. Yep. You got Crow Collier. She has time traveled back to Crow Collier. Still sitting house with off of mice. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, a gift. All right. <laughs> well, thank you guys for coming tonight. I hope you get to, to check out the exhibit too, and I hope we get to add to it throughout the years as we get more stuff i think there's there's a lot that we can we can do um with that and then next month is women's history month so i'm hoping like we can do a program on that and we will probably be doing a program on saint patrick's day so um i will let you know for sure that will probably be a very short program i'm not sure if we have quite enough so we might just supplement it with like jigging or something like that <laughs> dancing everybody bring their corned beef and cabbage and a beer and we'll, uh -uh. <laughs> So we'll let you know about that for sure. So thank you guys for coming. Thanks so much. Have a good night. Good, good job. Yeah.
We'll Enjoy the nice weather out there. Oh, we will. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.